Hello and welcome to a show we're calling The World This Year. The World This Year, uh, where we are joined by uh, Nico Hines, world editor of The Daily Beast. How are you, Nico? Very well. Hello. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, also in the uh, UK capital, Patrick Smith, editor-in-chief of uh, The Africa Report. How's 2021 been to you? Um... It's made me look forward to 2022 <laughs> in the hope it might have break the mold. <laughs> All right. Let's find out if independent journalist Aisha Gul Sert feels the same way. Oh, I feel fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and it's been a great year, I'm told, for Lila Jacinto, senior editor at France24.com. True or false? True, but 2022 is going to be better. 2022 is going to be better. The world this week. By the way, feel free to watch lower listen by subscribing and liking us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. 2021 did begin with a promise. It would be vaccines to the rescue. Between the time that the COVID-19 virus was first identified, uh, it was in a record short time that elapsed before the developed world had started rolling up its sleeve. Scientists warned us, you'll need to vaccinate the whole planet for this to work. Otherwise, the coronavirus will mutate, and mutate it did. First came the Delta variant, the one that's still ripping through Europe, and now a new one dubbed Omicron. No one should be in any doubt. There is a tidal wave of Omicron coming, and I'm afraid it is now clear that two doses of vaccine are simply not enough to give the level of protection we all need. Uh, Nico Heinz, uh... 2021 is not ending as cheerfully as uh, as we thought it will. Uh, we knew that uh, come winter time there'd be variants, but uh, when you think back to all that's happened this year, is it half full or half empty? The glass. Well, I, I'm personally feeling pretty miserable about it. All I have to admit, I think there's something that you know people haven't wanted to say because everyone wants to try and encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, but there's been a huge disappointment in how well the vaccines are working. You know, um, it's all very well saying <clears throat> we expected um, that we might have to have boosters down the down the road, but it is looking like even if you've had two or three doses, it may only be three months that it stops you getting you know new variants and that is a very depressing thought that we're potentially going to be having to have injections every three to six months for the rest of our lives and we still don't know if new variants will emerge that will then uh, escape those new boosters i mean the j and j booster seems to be almost entirely useless against omicron um, it's still early days for the data and the, the, the good news is that people are generally being kept out of hospitals, so I'm not saying it's a complete failure, but it's very disappointing that people are getting sick and that we're having to close things down again, even in the West, where there have been huge take-ups of the vaccines. And of course, it's even worse in the rest of the world. Yeah, even worse uh, in, in the rest of the world. Europe was slower off the mark than the US and the UK. Uh, we pooled purchases at the start of the year here. Uh, inocula inoculation rates uh, have more than caught up. Uh, but now, as again, governments talk of booster shots and jabs for five-year-olds, the World Health Organization and the developing world say enough. Firstly, they hoarded vaccines. They ordered more vaccines than their populations required. And when we wanted vaccines, they just kept you know, giving us the crumbs from their table. Patrick Smith, your, your thoughts when you hear, again, the, the UK Prime Minister talk about booster shots. Yeah, I mean, that, that was Cyril Ramaphosa's point about crumbs from the table. It, it gets to the real failure. Uh, it's a global failure, but particularly a failure of the richest countries in the world, the group of seven and the group of 20 biggest economies in the world, they were presented with a very clear plan by the International Monetary Fund and the World Health Organization. It was costed $45 billion to vaccinate the entire world, 70 percent of it by the end of this year and the rest of it by the middle of next year, which would have really made a dent on the proliferation of these variants uh, such as Omicron and such as Delta. 
Uh, the richest countries in the world fail to agree on that because they have their own national agendas in this kind of beauty contest of who gives most vaccines away. So the reality is that the international system has failed. And until these countries get a grip on this and put their hands in their pockets and come up with the $45 billion uh, to, to finance a vaccine program, we're going to have this continuing problem of the, the virus mutating and new variants coming up. And for all the vaccines that the rich world gives to itself, it's still going to have this problem in the majority of the world, the, the five billion or so people who are, have no hope of getting a vaccine at the moment. Here in France, um, Jacinto, they're starting to roll out the vaccines for five-year-olds. Absolutely. And, and uh, this year, it was UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres who used the term vaccine apartheid. Uh, this, this year is ending, uh, as Patrick uh, rightly says, you know, with, with once again, you know, nationalism come to the fore. And none of the systemic problems are of uh, the international health uh, system addressed. You know, we're so still if, if, if those vaccines do become available... Uh, is there the logistics on the other end to get them into people's arms? There will be the logistics, because when you are doing a health plan, you also plan the logistics. We managed to get uh, Ebola vaccines into remote parts of the Congo, you know, right by the border with the hundred, more than 100 militias operating there. So there are health, uh, you know, there are health plans get, that can be put in place. And what we have now are these uh, giant pharmaceutical companies who have produced these vaccines. We are paying for them. Governments have paid for them. Uh, and and, uh, you know, we are not even examining the whole uh, construction of, of patents and rights because, you know, the, the largest vaccine productions are, is, are in places in India. And there are countries in Africa saying, don't give us the crumbs enable us to to at least lift uh, on an emergency uh, you know on an emergency scale e enable them to manufacture uh, the, the these vaccines so yes we are entirely privileged in the west uh, and we we've incredibly got anti-vax movements in a part of the world that is so privileged, uh, while as, uh, you know, these variants, we don't know enough about Omicron, but it, it was first spotted in South Africa, the Delta variant, which is extremely potent, uh, you know, first came up in India, and we are seeing the cost of this. And we are not getting to the root of the problem, the root of the inequality of all of this. I should go, sir. I think the pandemic, COVID, really showed us. It, it, it served for, for the for the entire world as a mirror that we are saying, look at what what you are and what you have become, in the sense of more and more we push the rich countries, like Patrick and Lila just said, to have a second, a third, a fourth shot, a booster shot, another shot, while. What we know, there's a lot of unknown also with this, you know, with COVID. What we don't, what we do know is that until everybody is vaccinated, at least one, two shots, nobody is going to be safe. So the, the pandemic really showed us that unless we work in solidarity, which was, as you can remember, in France and Europe, a word that was greatly used at the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, pandemic. And now we see that actually... It serves no purpose. Uh, Nico Heinz, uh, I noticed there's a whiff of scandal as the year ends uh, by the banks of the River Thames. Uh, how much of that is because people are really sick of, like you said at the outset, of, uh, of all these variants and feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, maybe? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the, the the big problem here has been that we're suffering the same kind of ennui and misery as everybody else. I think um, London might be a little bit ahead of, um, say, Paris and mainland Europe in terms of the Omicron threat. Uh, and so we're feeling it now. There's a kind of real sense that everyone knows somebody who's just caught it or a friend of a friend who's just got it. Um, and so that is really hitting hard here. And there's stories bubbling up now saying that Christmas is going to be cancelled, there's going to be limits on how many family you're allowed around to your house. And of course, that really hurts people because they were looking forward to this Christmas after last Christmas was 
such a disaster. And then the reason that that's ballooned into this huge scandal, which is now potentially could even topple Boris Johnson, um, is because all these pictures are emerging of him enjoying parties last Christmas and his staff enjoying parties last Christmas, which he tried to cover up, but we have now discovered that while we were all at home, missing our friends, missing our family, Downing Street staff and the top echelons of the Conservative Party were having a jolly old knees up with glasses of wine and expensive cheese. We were just sitting I just, I love that Nico used the term ennui. I've always thought the term ennui is, is, a, is a sort of affluenza. Uh, and at the risk of putting myself out there, we haven't shown ourselves to be very resilient, you know. It was like, once again, we get with this cancel Christmas. It was like, oh, how difficult it must be that you don't have Christmas, but you have access to free vaccines uh, and you have free free testing. So I don't know what this really says for uh, for the resilience of, of the West. And I've always felt that resilience is something that people who don't have the privilege must have. So yes, of course, this is extremely difficult on us. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm seeing the champagne glass half full always. And I'm sitting in Europe with access to the vaccines, with, uh, with a free booster shot that's just around the corner. And uh, well, tough. Tough for you. And uh, yes, your politicians are having a Christmas party, but there's something deeper wrong with your politicians. And I really don't want to hear about other Christmas parties happening in Downing Street. Just get to the point. You know? Well, the thing I think that people, you know, if we put the politicians on the side, what people, the, the regular, ordinary people are thinking about is really... Can I see my family? Is this Christmas going to be like last Christmas? And I think that's what makes people get even more fearful of how can we celebrate the, 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 the thought of traveling, of, of gathering together. What I'm having a, a, a difficulty with is, for instance, in the Netherlands today, of how many people you can have at your house during Christmas and if they're related, to, or they can only come to your Christmas party only if they're related to you and maximum six to eight people. And I'm like, in what world do we live? Who are you to tell me, I mean, coming from Turkey, who can I have in my house? How many people I can gather? And that's the problem with, 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 with the pandemic is that it's being used in order to use, to come into people's intimate uh, lifestyles that I think is Inacceptable. I don't agree. <laughs> I think that you know, if we have free public health care systems, you know, governments you don't have do tell us free to public health care everywhere. You have it in France, so you, you can't talk as if France is right. But country, I, I feel you know. that you know another issue that this has brought out is the problem of individual rights and uh, and you know state uh, and public health responsibility. So uh, you know, governments are trying to have some sort of Christmas, and you know, they're obviously doing a bad job. But we all know they don't want the ICU used to be swamped. That's the yeah, problem. Yeah, but still, there's something, I think, deeper in that. Coming, Having seen countries that are completely authoritarian, I'm not saying that Europe is, the, the, the moment you start getting, passing the red line of interfering into how people live, I think that's very dangerous. Pa yes, Patrick Smith, your thoughts on this? Well, uh, my, my view is this. Um, we, we has, as, as Lilla said, we, we've got a public health system in much, much, of, much of Europe. I think uh, free public health is absolute uh, human right. It must, should be around the world. So we've got to think about how we can build something like that internationally. And, that, and, and, and again, that, that is for the sake, it, it's enlightened self-interest. If we're going to deal with these pandemics, and it looks like this is just the start of a series of pandemics, we're going to have to think very seriously about building a, a viable global health service that's free at the point of use. So I think that has got to be our responsibility. Um, I, I, I on the issue of individual rights versus the public right uh, to, to, to good health, uh, I, I'm very much on the side of uh, public solidarity on this. You know, we, we've seen the hypocrisy of the British ruling class in, in, in this matter. Um, and I think, you know, we have most of the, most of the people I know I, I, across Europe, at least, and in the States to a degree, have, have undergone huge sacrifice for the greater good. And they're doing that uh, without being told by, uh, you know, by a, 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 a jackbooted authoritarian police officer or something like that. They're just doing it because they feel that's what they should do. And that's that's the majority of, of opinion. Uh, and I think we, we need to, to 
to press on with that. So my, my view was, yes, you're going to have to accept that individual rights are going to be circumscribed for the greater good. And that, that is just where we are. Uh, and, it, you know, this is, this is a matter of life and death. People were, you know, as the political elite in Downing Street were having their parties, people were dying in hospital. Uh, and, you know, this, this is what has fueled the outrage. Uh, I think we just have to accept that we're going to have to to deal with this this uh, this new restriction or, or on some degree of individual liberty for the greater public good. Patrick, talking about the common good, uh, and the common good also has to do with how we uh, save our livelihoods the world over. In 2020, we saw the world shut down. In 2021, a stimulus-fueled recovery meant big spending and big demand coming all at the same time. Natural gas was supposed to be the magic solution to a soft landing away from fossil fuels. But uh, uh, we saw uh, at that point that uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, when, a, uh, a, a, uh, when power outages uh, uh, hit, uh, there was a stimulus fuel recovery. It meant um, uh, big spending and big demand at once. There were natural gas tankers that uh, literally changed course to serve the highest uh, bidder as energy prices yo-yoed and uh, fueled the highest inflation rates in decades. Nico Hines, we, we even saw uh, some fist fights at gas stations in the UK at some point. That's right. There was a shortage of fuel. It was actually not energy per se that was causing the problem in the UK. It was more to do with Brexit and its after effects and um, employment crunches because there weren't enough people to drive the fuel around to deliver it to the petrol stations over here. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> and I, I accept this point of the, the affluenza in, in Britain, but I can tell you what, people are furious and apoplectic with rage if they don't have easy access to their petrol because it's something that people have come become used to and they expect and anything that throws them out of their routine uh, you know is, is hugely damaging i cannot imagine what the reaction would be if Britain started to suffer, say, for, for example, some of the few hours of electricity outages that many countries in the world have. You know, Beirut's getting by with maybe one hour of electricity a day if they're lucky at the moment. But if we lost it for one hour a day in London, it would be cataclysmic for any political party in power. So although we're all operating on different levels here, what is obviously going to happen is that over the next year, because if we suddenly see another new stimulus in 2022, as we try and come out of this second wave of coronavirus uh, damage, then we're going to have the same problem, no doubt, because nobody's put in place these long-term energy plans that are going to keep us safe over the next decade. So we're bound to have ups and downs. And what people in the capitals of Paris and London and Washington DC need to be well aware of is that people won't put up with that sort of instability. So we have energy instability, uh, I should go assert, and we have just have inflation, the worst in four decades in many parts. Yes, in the US, I think it's the worst since the 80s, and in, unfortunately in Turkey as well, the situation is really bad. There are long lines of uh, people trying to gather some, uh, some uh, a loaf of bread, and and it's. I feel like we are we are leaving 2021 at least in terms of economy and inflation not on a good term. The situation in Hungary is not uh, very promising either. So it's not only the uh, quote unquote developing countries that are um, suffering from this, but there are also superpowers like the U.S. and also other countries of the of the EU. Where we are headed is really hard to see. Uh, but I don't think that the answer is going to be uh, visible in a month or two. Okay, so there's there's the issue of uh, inflation hitting everybody. That's creating another layer of uncertainty. Uncertainty over the pandemic, uncertainty over energy, uncertainty over inflation. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, the problems we had with uh, the planet overheating, they didn't go away. Uh, when those power outages hit... China went full throttle on coal plants. So did India, which also registered record seasonal smog in places. Ironically, that happened smack during the middle of the COP26 uh, climate change summit. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. This is not about some expensive, politically correct, green act of bunny-hugging or blah, blah, blah. 
build back better, blah, 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 green economy, blah, blah, blah. Leo Jacinto? Honestly, if you ask me what's the phrase of 2021, I'd say blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, v- she nailed it there. Uh, you, you know, the case that, that, that you brought out about India is, is, is extremely good because it was India was one of the countries that even, you know, in the blah, 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 India uh, had a hard negotiating position for to change the phrasing from phase out to phase down. And and India embraced coal uh, uh, this year because of the, the natural gas prices, um, uh, 70% of, of the... Uh, of and the in fairness to the Indian government, you can't just snap your fingers and uh, do an energy transition uh, by a stroke of a pen. Exactly. But uh, not in fairness to the Indian government, there also needs to be a, a long-term plan. And a lot of this was... was you know, straight off the seat reaction. You know, we need to have our, our energy uh, supply, so we, we boost uh, coal production. Uh, that's one. And two, there's a lot of greenwashing going on too, and that's something that we're going to have to uh, keep an eye on. So, you know, countries like uh, China and India have the biggest solar projects uh, uh, on the planet right now, but how are these, these projects happening? Who are the players? How much energy, how much conventional energy is being used to, to, to create green energy, you know, all these carbon footprints and carbon credits, there's going to be a lot of greenwashing in. And, and uh, at 2021, you've got people like, you know, kids like Greta asking for real solutions. And, you know, you get together in Glasgow, spend a lot of money and can't even come down with a phase out. Patrick Smith? Yeah, I mean, I think the critical issue is who is going to fund this transition. Uh, everyone agrees on the on the on the tenets. We've we've got to move to renewable energy. We've got to, we've got to move to solar, wind, hydrogen. Um, Energy. Some some say nuclear. I mean that that's a that's a, a more debatable area. Um, the question is where where is the finance going to come from? I mean what you've got at the moment for many developing countries in the world, which are going to be the the lion's share of the energy production and energy consumption over the next 30, 40 years, you've got a situation of fossil fuels now being verboten and no f- international finance available uh, in large swathes of Latin America, Africa and Asia, um, and told you, you've, got to tra- uh, you've got to make the transition to renewable fuels. But no one is going to finance it on the kind of level uh, you need. Uh, Obama's former uh, energy advisor has estimated that we need to be investing one to two trillion dollars a year for the next 10 years in renewable fuels in the developing world to, to hope to get the, the COP26 target of getting global warming appreciably below two, two degrees this century. Uh, and, and so with that kind of target, um, you know, it, it's not just a, a question of a few commitments uh, on, on coal uh, and, uh, and electric cars and the like. It, it, it's a, mi- a major sea change in the way we run the financial system. And I don't think COP began to address that, despite the fact we had Mark Carney there as the UN climate envoy saying that um, he represents countries with $130 trillion of assets. It's sad that those com- companies didn't come up with the, the wherewithal and the plans to change global finance to address this, uh, this energy transition demand. Yeah, we're going to talk about this issue of uh, uh, how to uh, invest in that transition uh, when we look now uh, at the United States. Less volatility from the planet's biggest superpower was the promise at the start of the year. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully. Yeah, but as you see in those images with Joe Biden sworn in at the scene where just two weeks earlier Donald Trump supporters had stormed the Capitol, it was clear that one oath of office would not magically bring civility back to a 240 year old democracy. Uh, Nico Hines. How long does the shadow of January 6th loom over U.S. democracy today? 
It certainly still lingers on and will continue to linger, but I do think that we can see that as a last hurrah of uh, the first Trump era, at least, if not the Trump era in total. Um, I think what has been more alarming is the way Biden has failed to steer America back to a more dominant and powerful, stable presence on the world stage. I think what happened while Trump was in office was that people all over the world accepted this was an aberration, this guy was crazy, maybe he was going to be here for four years, maybe he was going to be here for eight years, but we knew at least that we shouldn't think of America as Trump. What we were told and what most people believed, what capitals around the world and what institutions like NATO and the UN hoped for and believed was that once a, a normal president was back in control, that America would safely assume that position again. And, 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 and on that point, on that point, Nico, it's not just Trump and it's not just the Republicans. I mean, we've seen this Monday how... Um, the news that uh, it's a Democratic senator from coal country in West Virginia that's uh, killed that energy uh, transition big stimulus plan of Biden uh, that uh, uh, was needed in the ways that uh, Patrick Smith was describing a moment ago. Yeah, well, Joe Biden is just the latest victim of an intrinsic, intractable problem of the American system. When they set it up with all these checks and balances in order, because they thought they were setting up the most perfect union on earth, they thought they had all the answers way back when the constitution was written and the political process was set up. What they didn't realize was that they were basically forcing a sort of stasis over governing that would continue for the next few hundred years. And Joe Biden has found the same problem that, say, Bill Clinton did when he tried to get a huge health care bill through in his early years. If you try and do something which is, has a huge price tag and makes a huge revolutionary change within the country, it's almost impossible to get that thing through and you use up all your political capital trying to force it through the Senate. Um, and then after you've used up all your political capital in the first year of, of governing, everyone starts looking towards the midterms and then the next election, you've almost lost your power already. All right, and Joe Biden did follow through on one of Donald Trump's promises to leave Afghanistan before the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Now, retreats are never pretty. Uh, this one unraveled fast, faster than the Pentagon predicted with the mayhem and desperation uh, at uh, Kabul airport coming as the Western-backed president of Afghanistan uh, was resigning and fleeing the Taliban, taking the capital with barely a shot fired Lee Jacinto back in August. No, we did not see uh, the scenes of disaster, but people who knew Afghanistan absolutely were looking at this scenario. Joe Biden inherited a... Uh, uh, Peace nego uh, a peace deal between the U.S. and the Taliban that did not include the elected Afghan government. He uh, he followed through on his predecessor's uh, uh, plan. You know, he got out and he overturned a lot of Trump e administration era policies, but he stuck with this. Uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, and he, you know, he pulled out. It, it was it was such a political move, uh, you know, because by the end of the of the the U.S. mission in Afghanistan, we were down to 2,500 troops. The 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 death toll over the past five years was 100 in in, in combat. Right now, we still have 2,500 units. U.S. troops in Iraq fighting against ISIS. But this was sold as an election strategy that we are going to end this war, end the forever war. And, you know, and it's, it is more costly now because, we, uh, you know, America doesn't have a footprint in that region. The fueling from the, the Gulf uh, bases are, is going to be more expensive. Uh, Joe Biden basically turned a thumb on his, his whole idea of democracy. Uh, and, you know... I, you know, there's this phrase that circulates about Afghanistan being the graveyard of empires. I always detested that cliche and I never used it. But I think uh, it proved to be true this year. It, it is the undoing of U.S. power. When it comes to the U.S., uh, I should go, sir, they're imperialists if they stay and they're traitors if they leave. Well, I was in at, in Turkey at the Iranian border on uh, August fifteenth when Kabul fell. To fell, oh, that's that it didn't really fell. Was maybe given on a on a silver platter 
to the Taliban. And I can tell you that there were a lot of um, refugees coming from Afghanistan mm. to Iran and then through uh, the border going into Turkey. Uh, Biden, for me, did what the United States has done forever. Mm. It means um, it has done it in Africa, it has done it in Latin America, it has done it with the Kurds, which means we are here for you now, but when it's going to be a self-interest, we might leave. Um, what really hurts me in this story is that Biden, uh, President Biden, sold this um, departure from Afghanistan with a lot, with no remorse, and mm. uh, and also he even called it a success. And I find that there is a, a point where you have to, as a leader, take decisions, but also as a real leader, to take your responsibility and. And I think he failed, and he failed it to the inter towards the international tribune, and he's also failing today in terms of his domestic politics. Um, a lot of people are very um, deceived by what he, what he has been doing, also with the migrant crisis, which is another crisis mm. uh, that he has uh, inherited from the Trump administration, and that he's dealing with in a very unhumanistic way. Could it could it have gone differently in Afghanistan, Patrick Smith? Yes, I think it, it could have and it should have. I, I, I think what we should focus on right now, I mean, it, it, we're now four months after the fact of the, the U.S. Uh, withdrawal and the Western withdrawal, I should say, it, is the absolute appalling situation most Afghans find themselves in. 95 percent of Afghan people cannot get enough to eat. That is the legacy of this 20-year Western foray into Afghanistan. Uh, without getting into the, the, the finger-pointing and, and, and the blame uh, distributing over how the war could have been fought, that is the reality we've left. And that is an absolute, um, as far as I'm concerned, it's, a, it's an abdication of responsibility. You cannot go into a country for 20 years with your military force, spend tens of billions of dollars a year, uh, then four months after you leave, because you've been kicked out, you then say, well, right, there's, th there's no aid available to these people, and they're going to suffer because they've supported the wrong government. I'm sorry, that, that is absolutely unconscionable. So that, to me, is, is, is the bigger failure. And the, the failure of the West to come up with a viable approach to this. Um, there are ways of getting food aid without being suckered into the, the Taliban system. There's ways of getting food to hungry people, and we're not uh, treating that with the priority we should be treating it. To me, that is the critical issue with, uh, with Afghanistan today. And everyone you talk to, whether they're in the World Food Program, uh, the bigger UN system, the European Union, uh, USAID, they're absolutely appalled by the situation on the ground. Uh, and it, 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 it's really, it really needs tackling as a priority. Uh, sure, I mean, I, 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 and, that, and that would uh, at least uh, give people a sense that they still, despite the, the, the retreat of the, the Western forces, there still is a presence there, uh, a humanitarian, hopefully a medical uh, pres presence that will, will help them through, through this next period. And I, I think that can be administered without kowtowing to the Taliban in any way. All right, so we have uh, had a uh, continuity between uh, Trump and Biden when it comes to Afghanistan. Continuity, as Aisha Gul was mentioning, when it comes uh, to handling uh, migrants at the border to a certain degree. Uh, continuity as well, you could say, uh, in relations with China. Uh, perhaps one area where there's been a break uh, is in how to handle Russia. It was June that uh, Joe Biden met Vladimir Putin in Geneva for one of the Russian president's only visits abroad since the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, the, the two met across the lake from where uh, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev met for the first time. Uh, this time, uh, no thaw in relations like the kind uh, Nico Hines that uh, led to the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. Yeah, well, it's been a very interesting uh, kind of frosty handling between Biden and Putin, and it very much remains to be seen where it's going to end up. In June, we ran a piece uh, written by reporters we had in Donbass region sort of saying 
Biden's first big test, can he keep the rest of Ukraine safe from Vladimir Putin? Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. There was a piece in the Washington Post this weekend talking about how the US and the CIA were already coming up with plans of how to run an insurgency battle against Russia, Russian forces once they had invaded Ukraine, which doesn't tend to suggest that we're heading in the right direction, but that may just be very sensible contingency planning. We'll have to see. Um, but Biden absolutely has to make Putin know that it will not be accepted if Putin takes any further ground in territory. And that's where the US has to be, once again, has to become a, a powerful world leader who is you know, trusted but also feared around the world. Moscow has to know that if it dares send tr troops over the, over the border, that US and, the, and NATO will strike back against him in ways that will hurt his grip on power. All right, and uh, the uh, the uh, situation in Ukraine again. Uh, uh, the future is unwritten there. Um, the 15 Minutes of Fame Award for 2021 certainly goes to that YouTube fitness instructor. She was broadcasting live on February the first while soldiers uh, sped by in the Myanmar capital, thus unwittingly. Uh, offering the world the first images of the coup that uh, called time on the transition to democracy. Uh, what followed since is no laughing matter, Leela Jacinto. Yes, there are there are very egregious uh, human rights violations happening as we speak uh, uh, in Burma or Myanmar right now. Yes, that's the uh, that's this uh, you know the moments of the coup. Look, the Burmese military, the Tatmadaw, is 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 absolutely detested, and this in a, uh, and has always been. You know. I, when I was in Burma back in 2002, you know, the, 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 the level of how much the people hate the Tatmadaw is not what you see in places like Egypt during the Arab Spring or even Sudan, where they would, you know, they want the military to work with them. And this, this military is, 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 is conducting, it's always conducted uh, human, gross human rights violation with ethnic communities. Uh, but what the difference right now, it is, hap it is happening to the Burman, the Buddhist in the Irrawaddy, Irrawaddy Delta heartlands. Uh, critical right now is is what the regional powers are not doing and also what Biden, you know, at the, at the, at the start of this, this month, he had a summit for democracy and we've, we've got a movement that is absolutely crying for some sort of international, uh, you know, not military intervention, but support. Yeah, there's They've, a shadow government from the opposition. I was just going to bring that up. The National Unity Government is, is, is you know, they got, their, they got their act together. You can really see that it's a sort of post Aung San Suu Kyi generation. You know, they're, they're addressing minority rights, all this kind of thing that even Aung San Suu Kyi didn't do. And, you know, nobody's even recognized them. So a, a complete failure. I should go, sir. I think it's a complete failure, but it, it also brings, again, what I was saying at the very beginning of, of uh, the fact that the West, in a way, brought Aung San Suu Kyi as mm. this icon, as this embodiment of, 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 of all the... Uh, potential that a, that a country that has been under so much military pressure and uh, can bring. And and I was e extremely um, angered to see her at the International Criminal Court at The Hague uh, defending the military that actually is today behind uh, all the misery of her own family, but also of herself, and uh, pretend doing a... a Look, a business with the devil never works. I think that's what she tried to do by trying to do to to go on with the government since 2015 with a hand in hand in military. I have yet to see a country where the military has brought democracy. Mm. All right, uh, we're going to also look at one area where uh, uh, in Africa where. Uh, there's also this question about uh, democracy and uh, brutality. Uh, it was the year where we saw an African strongman killed on the battlefield in Chad, 
And another briefly trade his suit and tie for his old army fatigues, Ethiopia's prime minister, uh, going to the front after Tigray-led rebels vowed to march on the capital. 13 months after the start of Ethiopia's civil war, the front line now is extended uh, well beyond that northern region, with both sides accused of atrocities. Patrick Smith, how do you stop Ethiopia's civil war? Mm. I, th I think uh, with great difficulty, uh, that's what uh, all the people with good intentions from outside the, the country are finding. So you have the African Union, which is the, the regional organization with uh, 54 member states. It's actually based in Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian capital. So inevitably, uh, despite being... Uh, ostensibly committed to brokering a peace between the two sides, it's hamstrung because its headquarters are about two miles away from uh, the Ethiopian prime minister's office. Um, so under what circumstances can the African Union compel the Ethiopian prime minister to enter into talks uh, with uh, the Tigray rebels in, in the north? It's very, very difficult. You've seen a succession of uh, would-be mediators. Uh, we, Antony Blinken has been in the region. He was in, in Kenya uh, in November trying to persuade the Kenyan president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, to join the push for peace. Uh, you, ha you had a success succession of uh, European Union diplomats in, in, in the region. Um, but I think uh, and you, the African Union's own envoy, um, Olu Shagan Obasanjo, the, the veteran Nigerian uh, politician, diplomat, soldier, has also been on the case uh, without getting uh, any, any, any traction from either the Ethiopian Federal Forces, based in Addis Ababa, or the Tigrayan uh, rebel forces, based in uh, Mekele. And uh, the, the sad reality at the moment is both sides uh, believe they can win some sort mm. of military victory, uh, and they're not inclined to give up. And you've seen in the last month or so, you've seen the, the military advantage switch from one side to the other without uh, any sign that uh, either the t federal forces or the Tigrayan forces are capable of, of, of winning a, a decisive victory. So um, what, what you're seeing uh, late, later, later this week, you're going to see the UN Secretary Security Council debate Ethiopia uh, and perhaps put more pressure on the Ethiopian government to, to make concessions to Tigray and Tigray to make concessions to Ethiopian federal forces and enter into some negotiations. But I think it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, and it's, it's an absolute tragedy on so many levels, but most of all the human level of the suffering that's going on in this war. Um, but I, I don't think any early cessation is in sight. Lila Jacinto, what do you do when neither side shows willingness to, to make concessions? You know, I, I agree with Patrick, as would anybody on Ethiopia. This is extremely difficult because you've got two, two military powers that are pretty much have equal military force. Uh, in terms, uh, you know, another alarming thing is 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 the rhetoric that is happening on both sides. I was actually surprised by the amount I was trolled on Ethiopia. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, areas that you cover that you know you're going to be trolled. I did not know this. So, you know, this, this narrative that has taken hold that somehow the West is pro-Tigray is not going to help a sort of coming together in a negotiation process. In terms of Ethiopia, you know, what are the lessons that should be learned? Uh, uh, that we've come to this stage. Uh, obviously, there has to be a negotiated settlement because, uh, uh, you know, even if the if the TPLF comes into Addis, they're not going to be able to hold ground. And, uh, you know, the Ethiopian uh, Abi is not going to win people in Tigray. So there's no question about that. But, you know, what were the mistakes that we made? How did we overlook the fact that Abi had made himself into this potential savior? Yes, he won the Nobel Peace Prize based on uh, a, a peace agreement. But, you know, there were so many signs that we overlooked uh, and uh, and enable Abi to declare war on the TPLF, which is basically the strength of the Ethiopian army. So this was bound to pass. Yeah, one the irony, and it will close on this: the world's most famous Ethiopian these days, Nico Hines, happens to be a Tigrayan. Next month, Tedros, uh, next May rather, Tedros uh, Adhanom will be running unopposed for a second term as Director General of uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, whose message, as we said at the outset, is to get the world to come together to uh, fight disease.
Yeah, well, I guess in, in a sense that just highlights how out of touch these global positions are from the rea reality on the ground anywhere. A minute ago, um, Patrick was talking about how the UN Security Council is going to be debating what's happening in Ethiopia. But does anyone seriously think they're going to come up with anything that's going to have any material effect on the ground? Blah, blah, As blah. As we've been saying... <laughs> blah, blah, blah. There you go. The phrase of the year. Once again, let's just say good riddance to 2021. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll say good riddance to 2021, but we're not quite done yet. On Friday, we'll have a special edition uh, with a crystal ball. Uh, we'll be looking at the year ahead. I want to thank you, Nico Hines in London. I want to thank Patrick Smith, Leela Jacinto, Aisha Gold Cert. Thank you for being with us here, all here in the world this week. <laughs>